copies. And so when you have screen readers and you have the chat on, it's very distracting for a screen reader to try to go all over the place to um, read the presentation and read the chat. Um, so we have decided today to turn that off and use the Microsoft form. So thank you for that. So Michelle, if you wanna go ahead and hit record. Great. All right, we are recording. So next slide, please. So again, I wanna welcome everybody today. Um, as everyone is aware, it is um, National Disability Employment Awareness Month. And we are excited to offer this uh, webinar titled ADA, Reasonable Accommodations and More with Cindy Tarshish. Next slide. Uh, there will be a question and answer at the end of Cindy's presentation. As we talk, please put them in the Microsoft forums. Uh, at the very end, then, we are going to have a brief overview of a brand new uh, program that we have, um, DEED's Employer Reasonable Accommodation Fund, um, and Mr. Ray McCoy will be talking about that. And as always, DEED, VRS, SSB, and Career Force. Our employer services staff are here to support you as employers, so please contact us with any questions you may have. Uh, VRS and SSB, there is the um, link to that, and that can find your employment specialist in your area throughout the state. And also at the bottom is the Career Force website, um, and Liz has also put that in the chat. Thank you, Liz. And next slide. All right, so we again are welcoming Cindy Tarshish. Cindy Held Tarshis has been the director of ADA Minnesota since March of 2002. In this capacity, Ms. Tarshis is responsible for all trainings, presentations, conferences, information and referral, technical assistance, and day to day operations. Ms. Tarshis presents on all titles of the ADA with specific expertise in employment. Ms. Tarshis has served over 30 years or has over 30 years of work related experience in the disability community and is a certified ADA coordinator and licensed accessibility specialist. ADA Minnesota is a program within the Metropolitan Center for Independent Living. It is affiliated with the Great Lakes ADA Center, located at the University of Illinois at Chicago. This is one of 10 regional centers funded by the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, Rehabilitation and Research. Welcome, Cindy, we're excited to listen to you today. Take it away. Thanks so much, and thank you so much for having me here today. These trainings are one of my favorite um, things to do as part of my job. And um, NEDAM, or National Disability Employment Awareness Month, only comes around once a year. However, uh, this year we also celebrated recently the 33rd anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, which is exciting, and also the 50th anniversary of Section 504 of the 1973 Rehabilitation Act. So big year in the disability community. Um, so yeah, you heard who I am, where I come from, some of some of my um, areas of expertise. Um, my, my biggest claim to fame, and it's kind of a joke, but that I'm in the Guinness World Book of Records as the world's fastest talker. So I'm gonna sit back and I'm gonna try to go slow, but I wanna get to all of your questions at the end because I know they're gonna be fabulous. And also, as you can see by all my beautiful bullet points here, um, there's a lot to get through today and I am incredibly passionate about the ADA. So I will share that passion with you today and hopefully uh, you can pick up a, a thing or two um, about the ADA, most specifically Title I, our employment title. And since I'm assuming that uh, the majority of you here are business, business owners, HR people, SHRM members, um, big and, and small businesses, um, hopefully you'll pick up a, a few things. So what we're going to cover today, folks, is Title I. There's five titles of the ADA. You're not going to be quizzed on it in the end. Uh, it would always panic people when I would do an in-person presentation. I thought there was a test at the end. No test, but we're going to concentrate really hard on Title I, but there are other titles of the ADA that I'll tell you a little bit about. Um, we also will be going over disability definition because 
you know, who is a person with a disability under the ADA is very different than somebody who um, has a disability and gets on SSDI or has a disability parking placard or workers comp or any of those things. Um, then we're going to talk a lot about applications and the interview process, because I think that is kind of um, a sticky wicket when it comes to employers, employees, and people with disabilities in the ADA. Then we'll talk about kind of the safety net for you, the employer, of the direct threat and undue hardship and what that looks like um, for you. And then a big chunk of the presentation is on disclosure, um, meaning um, if you have ever had to disclose a disability to your employer or if your employees have had to disclose a disability to you and what that looks like for you and for them. Um, and also then following the reasonable accommodations that may be provided to this person with a disability um, after they disclosed and um, some tips and tricks and all of those good things and resources are always a, a big part of the presentation. Um, I think you'll be getting all of that put together in a nice little package. Um, I think there's a way for you to share your contact information. So I am gonna say next slide, please. Okay, so like I said, the meat and potatoes, which I always laugh at myself. When I say meat and potatoes, I'm a vegetarian, but the meat and potatoes of today's presentation is Title I employment that states under the ADA that no employer shall discriminate against any qualified individual with a disability in regard to any aspect of employment. So when we look at, you know, you know qualified, um, I, I say that in the very beginning uh, because it's so important. Um, the ADA was never intended to be a an entitlement program. So somebody with a disability is not gonna leap over somebody else that's less qualified um, to get that job, nor do you have to give the job to somebody who's not qualified to do it. Basically you have to provide an accommodation to assist them uh, to do the job, but the individual still has to be a qualified individual, has the skills, education, training, and, ex and experience to do that job. So in Title I, it's, it covers everything from soup to nuts. It's your recruitment process. So let's say you have all of your recruiting tools on your website. A lot of people do that in this day and age, nothing wrong with it, but you have to make sure that your uh, web page and um, any electronic stuff that goes with that is accessible to a screen reader. And I think that uh, Marcy or Michelle had mentioned kind of screen readers in the beginning of this presentation and why we chose to not have the chat on because the screen reader picks up and reads off the screen uh, what we are seeing. And so um, if you have not tagged your website or the materials properly, the individual with the disability is not gonna be able to utilize their screen reader and again, if the only way that you're advertising this job is through your website, it's kind of discriminatory to people that aren't able to access it. So it goes all the way from, from that, all the way to discharge and everything in between. So let's say that you have an employee uh, who is uh, deaf or hard of hearing and you know once a month you provide an ASL interpreter. We've got wonderful ones here today. Uh, you provide an ASL interpreter for uh, the, the monthly staff meetings. Um, you would need to provide also those interpreters. Let's say you have a, a company um, summer gathering. You know, we just did where I work a company, uh, a gathering. Um, you have to make sure that, well, first and foremost, that it's in an accessible place if you have employees that use mobility devices. Um, but also you have to make sure that you provide like that ASL interpreter to also be in attendance so that individual can enjoy the, the benefits and the goods and the services provided by that employer. So uh, next slide, please. What is considered a disability under the ADA? I kind of touched on that a little bit, that it's a little bit different than disability parking or you know, short-term disability and all of those things, which are all great as well. So in order to be considered, uh, it, for it to be considered your disability under the ADA, there's no list um, originally when the ADA was put into place 33 years ago, there was no laundry list of if you have this, 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 and this, then you're a person with a disability. It's really based on these prongs, which we call them. And there's three, there was originally three, I've added four. Um, I've taken the liberty because it's just as important as the other prongs. But if the individual um, has one of these four prongs, then um, they would be, the individual would be considered um, having a disability under the ADA. But you don't have to have all four. 
I just want to make that very clear. We had one training that was incredibly confusing because I did not state that. So uh, the first one is if the individual has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities, right? So that's the basic thing that somebody has some type of a, a disability, an impairment, a diagnosis that substantially limits them in one or more major life activity. What are those major life activities? You know, initially uh, before the ADA Amendments Act, I think I'll talk a little bit about that. I'm not sure if that slides in here, but me, basically walking, talking, seeing, hearing, communicating, concentrating, you know, all of those things are major life activities, right? Um, so then the, the, oh, just a little FYI. So eating was not originally a major life activity, which I found fascinating because at times, you know, eating is my major life activity, but it really was a problem for some people with, with disabilities. And I will give you a real life example. I give, uh, I've been doing this for decades and decades and decades. So I've heard quite a bit of stories coming through from employers and employees. Um, so I, I always like to add, uh, some real life examples and stories that I think you'll remember more than any of my facts or figures or statistics. So, um, oh, no, I forgot my, my example. <laughs> so, oh, so in any event, so major life, so major life activity of eating, we had a situation um, in the 90s where an individual uh, was a pharmacist in a small pharmacy. And the owner of the pharmacy said, you know, you can take your lunch break when you have no customers which would be fine, except that this pharmacist had diabetes and needed to eat at certain times or, uh, or you know, he was unable to think clearly and, and really function in his job. So that's what happened. You know, he was eating lunch, you know, three, four, five o'clock. It was not going well for his diabetes management. So um, he and other people, there was uh, lawsuits that uh, stating that, yes, eating should be considered a major life activity because for some people, that is how they manage their, their um, disability. And we see it also for people in checkout lanes, the, the cashiers aren't allowed to have food or beverage, but maybe because of their disability and their medication, maybe they need to have beverage or hard candy or something like that. So there's an example of how something would change in a major life activity. Uh, the second prong is that the individual has a record of such an impairment. So let's just say that the individual um, it no longer is substantially limited in any major life activity, but in the past they were, and now they are being discriminated because of that record, they are covered under the ADA. And the best say, example is if an individual, let's say, had cancer in the past and they go to apply for a job, and somebody's great aunt lives next door to your mother that knows that you had breast cancer of some sort or cancer. And then all of a sudden you're not given the job because uh, the employer feels that maybe it may impact their insurance or dependability, whatever that may look like. And that person is discriminated against because of their record of a disability. They are covered under the ADA. The third one is if an individual is regarded as having such an impairment, and that means that they are not substantially limited in major life activity, they have no record of it, but somebody has is, is assuming or regarded that person as a person with a disability and discriminates against them, they are also covered. And the fourth one is if you have an association with a person with a disability and you are discriminated against. So let's say um, you are applying for a job and you have a child uh, with a disability, and the employer maybe has made an assumption that you won't be a loyal, dependable employee because you are spending all this time with your, your child with a disability, which we all pretty much know. I think uh, most of us here are probably on the same page know that that child's probably in school the majority of the time. But let's just say um, that's not the case, and um, you are not given that job or that opportunity or that promotion or whatever that may look like because of your association with the person with a disability. We saw this a lot during the pandemic with individuals with COVID and now with long COVID. Um, so it's kind of, re it's rearing its ugly head a little bit more. Um, you know, people are afraid that if you have a family member that has long COVID, um, you're gonna be caring for that individual and not able to do your job. So, Next slide, please. I hope I'm making this clear. So, yay, I do have a slide on the ADA Amendments Act. So this was a good day, uh, you know, in the disability world and business world and the legislature when they realized that um, about 18 years post the, the passing of the ADA, we had a little problem. 
um, there were some Supreme Court decisions that really, really, really narrowed the scope of who was considered a person with a disability and what that looked like under the ADA. And the scope got narrowed so much that nobody was covered under the ADA and they realized it. The you know legislate, legislators realized it, business community realized, people with disabilities and organizations realized it. So they created the ADA Amendments Act and they really looked at major life activities and what that looked like. Um, and so first and foremost, they, they expanded the definition of major life activities by including these two non-exhaustive lists, right? The first one are the activities that the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, originally recognized. Remember those things I talked about, walking, talking, seeing, hearing, communicating, those types of things. And then the next uh, group was kind of um, things that were not specifically recognized, reading, bending, communicating, concentrating, things like that, that were kind of this gray area, for lack of a better word. And so now they are considered major life activities. But my friends, the best thing that happened, <laughs> I get very excited, is that they added this thing called major bodily functions. And it is what it sounds like. It are, these are functions that occur inside your body that are still major life activities. So functions of your immune system, normal cell growth. What is what is abnormal cell growth, folks? You know, that's cancer. So now we're, we're helping individuals that have cancer uh, be covered under the ADA. Digestive, bowel, bladder, neurological, respiratory, reproductive functions, all of these things are now considered major life activities and could be covered under the ADA. And so here I, you know, am in my office and this passes and I couldn't be more excited and I'm waiting for my phone call on major bodily functions. I'm at my phone, I'm at the ready, nothing comes. So about two or three months later, I get a call from a gentleman and he said, you know, I think I'm being discriminated against because I do not have a colon. My ears perk up, I'm like, oh, no colon, this is a major bodily function. And so we discussed what the issue was. And unfortunately for this gentleman, and I am not saying that this happens with all employers, but the majority of the employers I hear from, they are trying to help their employees with disabilities. But in this case, something went kerfuffle in this, uh, in this uh, situation where um, he, his job, they were timing how long he was using the restroom because they knew that he needed to use the restroom in a different way because he had no colon. So they were standing outside the restroom, literally timing how long it took. And then they were saying, well, now you can't uh, take your lunch break or you have to shorten your lunch break or you can't take your 15 minute afternoon break or you got to come in early and stay late. It was just not going well for this individual. So we really looked over and I talked to him and I'm like, well, do you work on like a production line where they have to shut down production when you're in the restroom? And he said, no, actually he was a supervisor. He managed his own time. He was getting all of his work done. He didn't even feel that he needed an accommodation because the job was getting done. But we determined that we really needed to look at this, work with this employer um, and get the accommodation of kind of a modified work schedule so that he could do his work as he needed. And that of course they would stop timing him when he was using the restroom. So all of these things happen. It was a really good education educational opportunity for this employer and um, it really helped the employee um, then um, learn to advocate for himself and it certainly helped me because I was able to use major bodily function and give that example today with his permission. So next slide please. Okay so the application process. So um, always my favorite part of the job um, because it can lead to some confusion. These are some of the things that I just like to point out immediately. Um, when you're looking at the application process, you can't have excessive job requirements and criteria on that, on that application or on that job description, right? So um, this happened more during the start of the, the ADA in the early 1990s. I'm not seeing it as much, obviously, anymore. But, you know, it was always, um, you know, every employee had to lift 90 pounds. You know, well, that's not 90 or 50 pounds, whatever it was, but not for every job in the company. You know, maybe a construction company, the majority of the people may have to uh, lift 50 pounds, but does the receptionist, you know, does the marketing staff? Probably not. So you can't put those excessive job requirements or criteria, and this one always gets me in trouble, but um, you can't put on there that the individual needs to have a valid Minnesota driver's license or the ability to drive if the job does not require that person to drive. But we got kind of, you know, into the weeds on 
having the person have to have a valid Minnesota driver's license. And again, a lot of people with disabilities don't drive, their jobs don't require them to drive, or a lot of other people choose not to drive. So um, that criteria, unless the job really is an essential function of the job, you can't really require them to have a valid Minnesota driver's license. What you can ask for, however, and should, is a valid Minnesota identification card. And you can get that down at the DMV. I, I just took my mom, she's 91 had to take her license away, very heartbreaking, did you all a favor, and uh, we got her for $14, which she thought was a great deal, uh, the, the Minnesota identification card, it actually looks just like a license. Um, the next thing are online applications. I think I talked a little bit about the accessibility issue of um, and making sure it's accessible to screen reader, but also the legalities. Because when you're first interviewing somebody and you've not offered them a job, you really can't bring up anything about a disability or you know, uh, do you have any impairments or disabilities that would make you not be able to do the job. You can't bring that up at that point you know, pre-offer. So you can't bring it up on your online application as well. But a lot of people inadvertently have that on there. And then unless you answer that question, you can't proceed further and to answer the rest of the question. So you're kind of asking them an illegal question. Okay, essential functions and reasonable accommodation on the application. I great. I think that you know um, every employer should list the essential functions of the job somewhere so people are aware if they're able to do the job, but you can't put it on the application. The, all the essential job functions and then have little bullets next to it where it says uh, circle here if you need an accommodation to do this essential function. Because what are you asking the person then to do if you're asking if they need a reasonable accommodation for that essential job function, you are basically asking them to disclose they have a disability and you, that is not something you want to inadvertently or on purpose do. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so here we go. We're now we're in the weeds here. The job interview, disability related questions and medical examinations. So again, I mentioned pre-offer, you can have no questions or examinations of the applicant regarding anything disability related. You've not offered them the job. Then post-offer, uh, you get this little window that opens up a little bit. EEOC says it's okay to ask questions and examinations are okay as long as they're required of all the applicants, uh, applicants in that same job category, you can't just say, well, you know, this person and this person appears to me to have a disability, so I'm going to ask them questions, you know, about the, you know, about the job, or I'm going to have them uh, give an example or demonstrate that they can do this. Unless you do it for everybody, uh, you, you can't do that. Um, then the window uh, kind of closes a little bit, and during employment, it has to be job-related and consistent with business necessity if you ask for any examinations or, you know, questions regarding disability, and it's okay at that point, and we'll get into that in a couple slides, when it is okay and it, when it's job-related and consistent with business necessity, and that is sometimes the case. I'm skipping up to the second prong where, you know, any type of questions or examinations, I mean, you can't be doing a fishing expedition in order to not hire somebody with a disability. And again, I'm not saying any of you would do that, but sometimes um, that's, it comes out sideways like that. But again, you want to get the best person from the job for the job and have a fit. So let's say somebody does need to drive a forklift, you know, you can have them show you an example of them driving a forklift, right? Um, or take a, an exam, you know, to see that they're able to do the job. Um, it, sometimes, you know, it's important because um, it's an opportunity for the person with a disability to demonstrate that they are able to do the job. We have an example, you know, this happens a lot where somebody who maybe is blind or low vision um, goes to apply for a job and it's all computer based and this particular hiring person has never seen uh, a screen reader, heard a screen reader, does not know how that works. So we always encourage that person, bring your laptop, have that software uh, downloaded and give an example, show the, the interviewer uh, how the screen reader works and how it could easily interact with their software system. So I, I think I'm gonna, oh, one last thing, to process an accommodation request, if the disability or the need for the accommodation, wait, back, 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 is not known, um, Oh, we're going to get there. If if it's, I'm it's sorry, just, that's okay. That's okay. We'll stop for a second and just get back to that previous one. We just kind of jumped again a little bit. Are we able to go back to that one? Uh, 
my slideshow's locked up. Oh, no. No, no, no. Okay. So here we go. Perfect. We're good. Okay. So to pro never get flustered during a presentation, it always works out. Uh, to process an accommodation request, if the disability and our need for accommodation is not obvious or already known. So this is kind of post the Amendments Act and why the Amendments Act was so important because previous to the Amendments Act, some employers were getting all hung up on, you know, um, the individual had to prove that they had a disability. So they were instances where the person was blind or deaf and it was obvious or a wheelchair user, and they had to go to the doctor's appointment to prove that they were blind or deaf or a wheelchair user when it was obvious. But if the disability is not obvious, it is not apparent, it's hidden, it's invisible, whatever term you're comfortable using, then you would be able uh, to ask some questions um, and or get some additional uh, medical documentation for that accommodation request. Now, next slide. Getting there to the next slide. Here we go. Okay, so we're still on the job interview disability related questions and medical exams. So these are some of the questions that you really, really shouldn't or couldn't um, ask of the individual. Um, you can't talk about the person's impairment or their disability or their diagnosis um, at all. Um, if they bring it up during the interview process, that's uh, them. You know, we are Minnesotans and we feel so gosh darn uh, obligated to tell you everything about ourselves. Uh, but in this case, it's not really necessarily a good thing because you don't really want to have that information or engage in that conversation at this point in time. You can't really ask about the individual's use of medication. You know, you can't say, well, because of our emergency preparedness, we need to know what kind of medication you're on. Now, are there some jobs where you can't be on certain types of medication? Absolutely, you know, and it falls into other laws. And at that point, you know, you would be able to do that. You know, you're an airline pilot, you can't be on certain medications, that's one thing but you can't ask the person during the job interview to give a list of their medications. You can't ask for a history of their workers' compensation uh, because they may have sustained a disability from, from an injury. Um, you can't ask about their mental health treatment or sick days. Um, so um, you, you can't say how many days did you call in sick last year, but you certainly can say, you know, tell me about your attendance record because you may have somebody that doesn't show up on, on Fridays and Mondays, and that's a different story. But you can't say how many days were you sick last year. Um, you can't say, and I've heard, you know, this is a really stressful job. Um, and so we need to know, do you have any mental health issues? Do you have any anxiety? Do you have any heart conditions that would be a problem with this? You know, these are things you cannot ask during the interview process or really shouldn't ask. Um, you know, I always laugh when, you know, people are, are told, well, it's a really stressful job. You know, I, I would like to know what job is not stressful because I'd like to work there. <laughs> I dream of working in a bakery one day. So, and then finally, you know, you can't say, do you have a disability which would interfere with your ability to perform the job? At this point, you just can't do that. So uh, I'm going to move on to the next slide, please. And what can you ask? Because you want to get the right person for the job. And I'm telling you, the person with the disability wants to have a good fit as well. You can ask and should ask, you know, whether the person can perform the essential functions of the job with or without a reasonable accommodation. And if you're going to ask that question during the job interview, I, I strongly suggest you ask it of everybody that you're interviewing. Because um, fun fact, I like to have those, the largest group of people with disabilities are those with non-apparent disabilities, those you can't see. So, you know, if you're trying to be respectful, you know, and talk to people that you think have disabilities to ask them, you know, uh, whether the person can perform the essential functions of the job with or without an accommodation, really ask that of everybody. You can ask about current illegal use of drugs because illegal drugs are illegal and are, are nowhere in the ADA. Um, also, you can ask about current illegal use of legal drugs. So that means, you know, let's say somebody has six different prescriptions from six different doctors going to six different pharmacies to get opioids or whatever it may be, that is illegally illegally using a legal drug, right? Um, I get a lot of calls about, um, well, first it was medical marijuana, and now we're moving into recreational marijuana. I will just tell you, as long as those drugs, like this marijuana, is on the um, Federal Controlled Substance Act, you always have to defer to the federal law, and it still would be considered illegal. But if any of you have those types of questions or want me to come to present to you on that topic, 
I have a great training on it. And then any history of workplace violence, because violence is never allowed in the workplace, even if it's caused by the individual's disability. So next slide, please. So what can you ask? So make sure that you are getting the best possible employee. You can ask why the person left their previous job. You can ask, here it is, whether the applicant will need a reasonable accommodation for the, for the application process. And the EEOC, EEOC, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, states that whether somebody, if somebody has, whether somebody with an obvious disability will require a reasonable accommodation to perform the job, right? So you can, if somebody has an obvious disability, ask if they, you know, will be, if you can't see it yourself, what the accommodation would be, you can broach that subject at that point. Next slide, please. Okay, during employment, what you may ask. So the EEOC, again, people that have made these, these guidelines and laws, says that the employer must have a reasonable belief based on objective evidence that this particular employee is either unable to perform the essential functions of the job because of a medical condition. You can bring up, you know, are you able to do the job? Should we, could you reach out to your uh, medical team and get some documentation? Should we talk to the ADA coordinator? You know, if you're, if you work for a state agency um, about uh, getting some accommodations in place, but if you feel the person really is unable to do the job, can you, can you, you should, you should, because a worst case scenario, you don't, and, and it's quite obvious. And then the person files a complaint against your company and they say, well, you know, they, ne they never reached out and offered me any type of accommodations, right? Um, this is where you probably would do that. And EEOC will say, well, you know, it was obvious to you that the person was struggling in their job. Did you have a conversation? Did you offer accommodations? So people, employers in the beginning were very nervous to do this, but it really behooves you to do that. And the next one is if you feel that the individual with the person with a disability will pose a direct threat because of this medical condition. And I will tell you direct threat and safety is a pretty high bar, but I'll give you an example of a phone call. So next slide, please, so I can go through these. So I got a phone call from a gentleman and he said, um, it was an employer and lots of employers call me and please do. Um, you know, he said, I think I'm gonna have to terminate my the employee because um, he has, and I'm pretty sure it was Parkinson's, but some type of a disability where his hands were shaky. And he said, you know, we've got long rows of cubicles uh, where we work. And I know you're going to know where I'm going with this, but the coffee pot is on one end, his cubicle is on the other end. And we're very concerned that when he's walking by the other cubicles, that he's inadvertently going to spill this hot coffee on himself or his colleagues, right? So this was the issue. And, you know, this is a federal law. I am like Switzerland. I never give my opinion, but I did say, you know, let's go through these things and talk about this. And we talked about the nature and the severity of the risk. You know, was there really one? Um, was the imminence of the harm, the likelihood that it would occur? Has it occurred? Are your other staff really worried about this occurring? Um, all of these things. And unfortunately for the employer, but fortunately for the employee, he could not answer yes to any of these. And we determined really it did not rise up to the level. And now, listen, there are some, and I can give you examples if you want at the end, where it really does rise to the level, um, but this one did not. So we hung out. Then, gosh darn it, what I should have done, and you think about it after, don't you? Whether the risk could have been eliminated or reduced. I did not talk to that employer about that. And I probably should have, you know, could they have moved the coffee maker to his end? Could he have had his own coffee maker? Could we have served iced coffee? Could be there be lids on the coffee cups? I mean, so many different things. So um, I kind of felt I failed on that end. So that's why I use this as uh, an example. So next slide, please. Okay. <clears throat> why would an employee disclose any disability, apparent or not, right? Well, the only, only reason <clears throat> that the employee would have to disclose they have a disability is to ask for a job accommodation. You know, I've had a lot of people with disabilities say, oh my gosh, I really do need help, but I don't want my employer to know, you know, but at the end of the day, I, I coach them and help them to do that because, you know, employers are not meant to be mind readers, especially if it's a non-apparent disability, or even to know if the person needs an accommodation. Other reasons that uh, an employee may disclose to you is to receive benefits or privileges specifically for employees with disabilities. And I have seen wonderful things that employees have given uh, or provided for their employees with disabilities. They have special job fair days where they bring in equipment. Uh, they may be a closer parking lot for those that have mobility issues. 
Um, I think DHS, Department of Human Services, even has a wonderful uh, group, Employees with Disabilities, where they have some funds that they can uh, do things with to help others. So, um, you know, in order to receive those benefits or privileges, the employee may have to disclose they have a disability. And also to explain an unusual circumstance or phenomenon. So what does that mean? Um, another story. I had a gentleman who called and he said, I think I'm going to be fired. Uh, they think I'm drunk at work. So listen, I get a lot of callers with alcoholism. So I said, well, are you drinking at work? Do you have you know, are you bringing alcohol on the premise? And he said, no. He said, I'm an individual who has diabetes. I can't get my blood sugars regulated. My medication's not working well. <clears throat> so I said, well, have you disclosed to your disability that you're not drunk at work, that you have diabetes? And he said, oh, no, no, I'm afraid I'll get fired. I hear this a lot. I'm afraid I'll get fired if I disclose my disability, right? So I said, well, you know, could you take it, you know, an accommodation? And he's adamant, I don't need any accommodations. My suggestion for an accommodation was taking a short leave where he could get his medication in order. <clears throat> he did not care for that solution. So he went back to work. I don't know what happened, but I do use it as an example of an unusual circumstance or phenomenon that somebody may choose to disclose to you. They have a disability, um, even if they don't need an accommodation, just to explain that or point that out. So next slide, please. <clears throat> Why would somebody not disclose a disability? And this happens a lot. You know, you think this law is in place, it protects people with disabilities, <clears throat> excuse me, end of day, but not necessarily so. Sometimes the employee doesn't need an accommodation or they don't need one until 10 years into their employment. That's okay. Or the employee is afraid to disclose because they're, they're fearful they'll be stereotypes, misunderstood, not believed. They are concerned that it won't be kept confidential that they'll be retaliated against, all of a sudden they'll be demoted, it'll be used against them, their job description will change, um, they'll have a cut in hours, all of these things, or they just choose uh, to, to have this information remain private, right? So these are all valid reasons not to disclose, but it, it, it's going to be difficult if the individual is not able to do the job, um, but yet they've not disclosed, and that's a non-apparent disability. But everybody has their right to disclose or not disclose a disability. Next slide, please. Okay, so the next slide is what an employee may disclose to you when they choose to disclose. So they may disclose a general information about their disability. They don't have to give you all the all of the information, but just about that particular disability or impairment um, that they may need an accommodation for. You know, why they're disclosing. They're disclosing because they need, they need a disability. You know, how it affects their ability to perform the, the job duties and also types of accommodations that have worked for them in the past um, or types they anticipate needing. Now, somebody may be newly diagnosed, right? And that may be an issue. So if they are, um, hang on one second, I just, I'm gonna do something here. <laughs> I do not work in my house by myself. <laughs> I have a, a coworker, my husband, so I have blurred him out, I'm, I'm hoping. So um, types of accommodations that they anticipate needing. Now, if somebody is newly diagnosed, they are not gonna know. Um, so I'm gonna put in, a, in a, a commercial right here for the Job Accommodation Network. Um, they are fabulous. Uh, they help um, employers, employees, people like myself, help people to figure out types of accommodations that may be um, beneficial. Uh, they're a free service. They're based out of the University of West Virginia, and our government pays for it. I say you should use it. Uh, it's on the end, but it's so simple to get to. It's just askjan.org. So next slide, please. Okay, confidentiality of a disclosure. This is probably my most important slide, so pay, pay close attention, please. Um, all disclosure details, requests for accommodation, medical documentation, it all has to be kept in a separate lock file, separate from the person from the per individual's employee file and their personnel file, because a lot of people have access to the employee's personnel file, which I did not know. <laughs> I was I was horrified when I was you know to, to learn that because who knows what's in your in your personnel file. So I just but still um, you know there are, there are situations where I did have a, a situation actually where uh, somebody was up for a promotion and um, somebody was up for a promotion and was in, unable to get the promotion because the manager of the other department went in and uh, looked at that individual's confidential information and found out that they were a person with a disability. Uh-oh, did my slide go? 
I wasn't quite done with that slide. Okay, are we back? Oh, thank you so much. Okay, so in any event, um, what happened during the pandemic with this is that people would call me and say, my locked file, the HR would call and say, my locked file is in my office. Now, what, where do I put this information? And we kind of just said, you know what, find a place on your computer that only you can get to that's confidential and put that information in there. Um, also, uh, information regarding the employee's disability may be shared only on a need-to-know basis. So when this person discloses to you um, or to HR or whomever, not everybody in the company needs to know, um, only those that uh, maybe would be involved in the accommodation process or would need to know if that individual's job was modified in any way, right? So it's always, always, always on a need-to-know basis, right? And then appropriate response to inquiring colleagues and coworkers. I work a lot with union stewards, so I don't know if you guys, if a lot of you are with union uh, shops or whatnot, but we always have a situation where um, somebody's given a, a confidential accommodation, and then the other coworkers go up to the to the boss, I guess, and say, you know, the manager, the foreman, whomever, and say, you know, why did that person get that? That's unfair. Why did they get the closer parking mm -hmm. stuff? Why did their shift change? All of these things. Because, um, you know, do you have a, something going on with that person? It's very, very uncomfortable. And really, the only thing that individual can respond to is two things. <laughs> somebody has their, I think somebody might have their, their mic on that's live. I don't know if we could turn that off for that, help that person turn that off. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, so the only two responses that that individual could, could say is, you know, uh, this is confidential information. And just like you would like your information to remain confidential, we are doing that with this, this person. But please know we are complying with the federal law. And that should be the end of it. What you cannot do is say what the federal law is. Because if you say, and I don't think you would, um, you know, we are complying with the ADA. What is the ADA? You know, it's the Americans with Disabilities Act. Now you've inadvertently disclosed that this person has a disability. So just keep that in mind as a thinker. Um, next slide, please. Okay, what the EEOC says about disclosure. Basically, an individual uh, with a disability can request an accommodation at any time during the application process or during the period of employment, right? It doesn't, if the individual did not ask for uh, an accommodation when they were applying for the job or even after receiving the job, that, that doesn't mean that down the line, they may need an accommodation. So I'm gonna give you another little story because <laughs> I think people enjoy them. Um, so we had a, an instance where a woman who has MS, multiple sclerosis, got a job during the winter months. Minnesota, pretty cold, right? She was fine. But then what happened was in June or July, um, it became very hot in the area that she was working, right? It, it, un, un, really um, unusually hot. And because of her disability with MS, as she said, she became a wet noodle and had to go home by noon. She couldn't do her job. What, what are we going to do here? So I said, well, let's look at accommodations. It was a fairly good sized company. Let's just ask as an accommodation that in your area that they put in one of those cute wall unit air conditioners that we've all used for our college kids, right? So she went back to her employer and the employer uh, said, and it was not good. The employer said, oh, no, no, no. You know, you didn't disclose that you had MS or any type of, you know, heat fatigue issue uh, when you applied for the company. So you kind of lied to us. So now we feel we can't trust you. So of course, since we can't trust you, we're not, we don't have to give you this accommodation because you didn't tell us in the beginning. So, you know, she called me back. I, I felt horrible because I was the one encouraging her to ask for the accommodation, but then didn't feel so bad because we had the opportunity to go to that employer and educate them and say, hey, listen, EEOC says that a person with a disability can ask for an accommodation at any time in their employment process. This employer was unaware of this. So they did get the individual, the wall unit air condition, you think done in the story. But now I got a call several months later from this individual and I never hear good news back um, saying that, oh my gosh, not only did productivity increase by a great amount in her area, but also in the other surrounding areas that were also cooled down by the air conditioner. So it was a win-win for everybody. So next slide, please. Okay, so what the EEOC says about disclosure, you know, an individual with a disability uh, should request an accommodation when they know there's a workplace barrier that's preventing them 
uh, due to a disability uh, before they're having issues with their job, right? As a practical matter, it's in their best interest to request an accommodation before their performance suffers or conduct problems, problems occur or a PIP occurs. I was just working with a woman yesterday who has a PIP, a performance improvement plan. And because she has a seizure disorder, um, it was not apparent and she had not really disclosed. So I explained to her, I said, you know, anything in that performance improvement plan before you disclosed about your seizure disorder is okay. They, they certainly can hold you to that. Um, but going forward, now that you've disclosed, that's a different story. And then we start the accommodation process. And I also explain that you can't combine the two or mix up the two or merge the two in any way. Like your employer can't say to her, well, you know, we'll, we'll look at the accommodation process when you're off your PIP in three weeks. Or because you're on a, a performance improvement plan, we don't have to engage in the, in the interactive process uh, for an accommodation. It is not true. You can't hold, you know, you know, back somebody's accommodation process or the need for accommodations because of the PIP. In this case, it's really ironic because they changed your job description and because accommodations weren't provided to do the new job that she needed, um, that's how she got on the performance improvement plan. So it's a little sticky. I may have to talk to some of you out there to help me to help her uh, process that. So next slide, please. Okay, so what is a reasonable accommodation? Uh, that the legal language, any change in the workplace or the way things are usually done that provides equal opportunities for people with disabilities. What I like to say is, you know, and I'm not a big sports gal, but it's the thing that levels the playing field. It's not that it's going to give somebody an unfair advantage. Again, the ADA is not an entitlement program. You don't have to hire somebody that's not as qualified. But basically, the reasonable accommodation is the thing that levels the playing field so everybody can do their job equally. Somebody might need a reasonable accommodation to do the job. That's okay, so as long as everybody is on fair footing. And general rule is that the employer provides the accommodation to a qualified individual um, if the disability requ is requested and it's not an undue hardship for the employer to do that. So next slide, I'm gonna talk to you about a little bit of safety net that was put in place for employers about um, you know, what is undue hardship? <clears throat> uh oh, back me up. Okay. Okay. What is undue hardship? It is a, there's two. There's what is a significant difficulty or expense if it's a financial hardship? Um, you know, it just costs too much. Some, a smaller business, um, it, it, it may be more difficult for a smaller business to provide um, that amount of money, but a larger company, you know, the state of Minnesota, biggest employer in the state, maybe would be able to provide that accommodation where a small mom and pop shop might not. But that being said, the, the business or employer can't say, no, it costs too much without doing their due diligence and really looking into how much that's going to cost and you know, you know where they have money put away for accommodations, which they should. So, so it focuses on the resources and circumstances of that particular employer. The other um, um, undue hardship would be if it's an administrative undue hardship. If something changes the whole nature of how you do your business, uh, to provide that accommodation, you don't have to provide that accommodation. Maybe there's something else you can look into, but let's say you get a somebody who you hire and your hours of operation are always nine, you know, eight to four, and then you get somebody who hire them and they say, well, I have narcolepsy, I'm on medication. Uh, so can you change your hours of operation to 10 to six for the company for me? Well, no, I mean, that that's an administrative undue hardship. These are, this is when you do your business. Um, you don't need to change your whole hours of operation, right? That would be an undue hardship for you. Uh, next slide, please. There's principles of reasonable accommodation. Most importantly, the process has to be interactive. The employer and the applicant or the employee, you know, whether they have the job or not, has to engage in this conversation, this, this compromise, this give or take. The, the employer can't just say no, you know, without saying why, or at least having a conversation with the employer, right? Um, it has to be an effective accommodation. It can't be, and, and there's a lot of them, you know, and, and there's resources to help you like Jan or me, but um, it has to be effective. You can't say to somebody, you know, let's say that they are deaf and they are requesting an, a wonderful ASL interpreter for the staff meeting. You can't say, well, why don't you just sit next to Cindy and she'll write notes back and forth. Well, first of all, ASL is not English. So it's not the individual's first language. It might look like what I'm writing could look like French to the person, you know, it's two different languages. So that would not be an effective accommodation. 
Um, the obligation applies only to accommodations that reduce barriers to employment as they relate to the person's disability, right? You don't have to go above and beyond in that regard. Um, well, there's an example. I guess um, I did have a, an example. I had a gentleman who used Metro Mobility. And if you know anything about Metro Mobility, it's the paratransit system in the Twin Cities. It's great. They're wonderful. They're the best and the worst system in any given day because depending on when you're riding it, right? So this individual was getting to work late. Um, so because of Metro Mobility. So he said, as an accommodation, can we move my work around where I come in earlier and leave earlier so that I can get my Metro Mobility rides earlier? Great accommodation. They took care of it. Then in the spring, same gentleman says, hey, my kid to have soccer practice uh, earlier you know, in the day and I want to go to soccer practice, can we change all my work around so I come in later and or I come in earlier, leave earlier, whatever it was, the reverse. And no, because it wasn't really an accommodation that reduced barriers to employment as it relates to their disability. It was more as personal life. It wasn't really uh, work related. Um, it doesn't have to be the best accommodation as long as it's effective. You don't have to do the $2,000 software package or the you know, $4,000 ergonomically correct chair. If there's pieces that, will, that don't have all the bells and whistles but will still do the job, that is perfectly okay. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, what do we mean by the interactive process? So generally, generally speaking, it begins with a request from the person with the disability that will request an accommodation. It doesn't always have to occur that way as we just discussed, sometimes an employer can reach out, but generally it begins with the person asking for an accommodation. There's no magic words, you know, I as a person with a disability, I'm entitled to accommodation under Title I of the 1990, you know, ADA Act, none of that. It could be as simple as, hey, you know what, I have something going on here and I'm having a hard time doing my job. I'm wondering if we could talk about that and getting me some help for this job. Those should be all red flags like, oh, okay. Well, then you could say to that person, oh, all right. Well, um, do you want to talk to HR? Are you comfortable talking to me? Do you want to talk to maybe you have an ADA person um, and talk about some accommodations? But the request does not have to be in writing, right? It doesn't have to be in writing. Should it be in writing? Personally, I think it's better if it is in writing because I get calls from people that say, I had my accommodations in place for years and years, and now they're saying at my I don't have any accommodations in place. And I always say, well, do you have a new supervisor? And they're like, oh, how did you know that? You know, I look, I look so bright. No, it's because the new supervisor has no documentation that these accommodations were ever in place. You know, the person says, well, I was kind of friendly with my manager. So we just went out to lunch and talked about what would be helpful and it worked for years. But if it's not in writing in that separate lock file, um, there's no record of it. You know, there's a precedent that's been set and we can, you know, and maybe some of those accommodations really aren't necessary anymore. Who knows? We got to start from square one. Um, the request can come from somebody other than the employee. You know, it can come from a parent of an adult child with a disability if they're having uh, issues uh, requesting accommodations. I've requested them for people, chemical dependency counselors, you know, our wonderful VRS staff has have, have been in that process. So it doesn't have to come from the person with the disability. And the ADA requirements don't prevent you as the employer from going above and beyond what the ADA requires of you. What the ADA requires of you is just the baseline. But if you have an employee, and they're wonderful and they've been there 20 years and they're an integral part of your, your operation, you certainly can accommodate above and beyond what the ADA says that you have to do. Next slide, please. Okay, requesting an accommodation. Um, you would follow the, the employer's policies and procedures. Sometimes I always say to the person, hey, check with the employer or HR. Do they have a form that you need to fill out and bring to, bring to, the, bring to the doctor? You know, um, maybe they already have that. And, you know, you could skip right to that part, right? But um, sometimes the employer doesn't have the formal process, which is okay, um, and you, but you still want to submit a request in writing to the immediate supervisor. Um, oftentimes on the JAN website, that Job Accommodation Network, they have a beautiful template that I've used to help people. Um, I suggest, you know, you save a copy and you send a copy so you have it via email or you as an, as an employer, perhaps, you know, get that in writing as well, one way back and forth through an email. Does the ADA say you have to do that? No, but it's in the at this point, it's probably important to, to save a copy of something in the accommodation process. Next slide, please. Okay, if the accommodation is reasonable, 
um, you can provide it. If not, you have to show what evidence you have to substantiate that it is not reasonable, right? I always say when somebody gets denied, go back to your employer and say, what's the undue hardship for you to provide this accommodation? And then that, you know, the employer starts to think about it. And sometimes there really are undue hardships and that makes perfect sense. Sometimes the employer just didn't think that through. Um, it has to be uh, determined case by case. You cannot have generalizations. You can't say, and I heard this happen once, we can have no people with epilepsy here. Well, why are they saying that? Well, they were a construction company and they had an employee that had epilepsy and it was uncontrolled and they were on the roofs and it was a dangerous situation. This was the direct threat example where it did rise to that level. But then they took it one step further and said, we don't want anybody with epilepsy working here. And you can't do that. That's discriminatory because again, can the uh, you know accountant maybe have epilepsy? They're not up on the roofs or the, you know, can the front desk person, the marketing people, you know, you have to look at case by case. You can't generalize all people with one disability. You can't say if we do it for you, then we're going to have to do it for everybody because unless everybody has the same disability and asking for the same accommodation, then maybe. But first of all, the accommodations are kept confidential, right? So there's no need for you to say, you know, if we do it for you, then we have to open it up all to the whole company. That's not true. You know, you could say, well, you know, our policy is X, Y, and Z. Well, the individual with the disability could request an accommodation to that policy just for them that they're able to, to, to have that accommodation. And really, really avoid saying no unless you can substantiate why. I think I'm still can time here. We got about another half hour. So I'll give you an example where this didn't go well. Um, it ended well, so happy about that, but we had a woman who had migraine headaches and she went to a new company and the fluorescent lights up above were not muted. It didn't have the casing above it. And so again, by the middle of the day, her migraine was such that she needed to leave. So she asked the owner of the company, hey, do you think you could put up these shields? I've had them in my previous company and they mute the fluorescent light. And the, the you know business owner said, no, I'm sorry, they cost too much money, can't do it. Okay, did they, did they do the due diligence? Questionable, but that was the answer. So she took it for what it was and that weekend was in uh, the company, went into work and was working in the dark. You know, she just had the curtains open and was working in the dark and the maintenance person came by and said, what are you doing? Let's put the lights on. And she said, no, no, no. Um, and then she said, do you know where I can get the shields for above the fluorescent lights? Uh, where can I purchase those? Which you really don't want your employees purchasing the accommodations unless it's necessary. And, you know, sometimes VRS can find some money for you. Um, I don't think they're going to love me saying that, but <laughs> I think they can and have. Um, but in any event, the maintenance person said, oh, my gosh, don't worry about it. I have a whole bunch of those uh, casings uh, in my workroom. Okay, right? She was blown away. So Monday morning, he put them up. It was great. She called me. I'm so happy. The maintenance person had them. They're up. But then I started to think, and you know, my job is not to push anybody into filing a complaint against their employer, but I thought, oh, you know, she could, you know, and she probably would win that case because this employer said, no, it cost too much money. It didn't do their due diligence. Didn't even look to see if they had them available. So, but it all worked out for her. So I was happy. Next slide, please. Okay, if the request is reasonable, you implement it, you can evaluate it, you can go back um, to see if it's effective, maybe things need to be changed, you, periodic review is absolutely fine as long as it doesn't turn into, you know, a harassing situation where you're going back every two weeks and saying, do you still need this, do you still need this, um, which doesn't really happen often, I've only heard of one or two cases where that was the case, but I, I say it. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Um, you should go back and check because maybe the individual circumstances change. We're having a lot of this with long COVID. I am doing so many presentations on long COVID and reasonable accommodation. Anybody wants to bring me back for that, I'm happy to help you because we're really looking at accommodations in a different way uh, because we don't know when and if the symptoms will subside. So a little commercial for future training if you want. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, reasonable accommodations. What do these look like? Here's some examples. I promise to give you some. Physical modification to the workspace, maybe raising a desk up for wheelchair, quiet areas for individuals that have sensory issues, air purifications for people that have chemical sensitivity or were concerned about COVID in the workplace now, lighting, doorways being widened, 
Uh, you've got your job restructuring, part-time work, modified work schedules, reassignment of non-essential functions, modifying when and how and where the task is performed, um, altering arrival and departure time, and telecommunications. So telecommuting, right? Not telecommunications. That's a different title of the ADA, Title IV. But in any event, to telecommute or hybrid or you know telework, all of these things where the individual can work from home, that's a whole big issue. I don't think we've got time to talk about it now, but if a question comes up about it, I'm happy to answer it. Um, leave, it has to be related to the person's disability. It can't just be, you know, it's better for me to go to Disney World in the in the summer months. It, it has to be more, and I had a colleague who had um, a beautiful service animal. Um, that service animal got old, she needed a new one. So she needed a leave to go out to California to train the new service animal. And also um, accommodations could be, you know, providing qualified readers or interpreters um, like we have today. Um, next slide, please. Uh, things are that you don't have to do as an employer. You don't have to, uh, oh, I'm sorry. This is still something you should do. This is the reassignment to the vacant position. This is kind of the Hail Mary of accommodations. So if let's say somebody has a job and they get injured, right? And they're no, they come back and they're no longer able to do that job. They're in construction, but now they use a mobility device. They're not gonna be able to climb a ladder, whatever it might be. What do we do? Because there's no accommodation that's going to help that person, you know, uh, do that job. Do we terminate them? You could, or the individual as a last resort could ask for uh, a reassignment to a vacant position. So if there's a job that they are qualified, they have to be qualified to do that position, right? Then they would be placed into that position. They wouldn't have to interview for it. Uh, they would literally transfer into that vacant position and have that work. So um, it, it could be a different rank, a different pay, different hours. That's okay. But um, you don't, as an employer, you don't need to kick somebody out of that job or create that job. You would just need to transfer uh, that person to that vacant position as an accommodation. So next slide. Hoping it's the one I'm looking for. Oh, more acquiring or modifying equipment, changing testing and training materials. Uh, maybe somebody has attention deficit disorder and they need additional time on your training materials or testing. Somebody might need the materials in an alternative format, perhaps Braille. Um, modifications of policies and procedures is a great accommodation because it costs you nothing. You just modify that policy and procedure. And if you modify it for that individual, does not mean that you have to modify it for the rest of your workforce, right? Um, a quick example, I think I'm okay, that um, you know, an individual, uh, let's say they utilize, you. everybody in your company, all women wear dresses, all men wear suits, but this uh, employee has a leg bag, right? And they want to ask uh, as an accommodation, uh, can I wear pants because I don't want my leg bag to show? Sure, that's a modif modification to that policy, but that doesn't mean that you have to have all women wearing pants, right? Okay, next slide, please. I think we're getting to the end. Things you don't have to do as an employer, you don't have to ever remove an essential function um, as an accommodation, because you still have to be able to do the essential functions with or without accommodation. You don't have to hire somebody else to perform that function. You never have to lower production standards for that individual because they still need to be able to do the job. But if everybody's, you know, production standards are lower, you can't hold that person to a higher production standard. You don't have to reassign them to a different supervisor if they request, but they, they could request to be supervised in a different format, maybe the way that person is supervised um, is exacerbating their mental health treatment, right? You don't have to promote to a higher position or light duty. Any of those things are more work or compish. Um, you don't have to excuse misconduct, even if it's related to the disability. And you don't have to provide personal use items like eyeglasses, wheelchairs, prosthetic limbs, and now hearing aids are a big issue. Uh, that people uh, need as the boomers age, as us boomers age, uh, people are requesting hearing aids, which you don't need to provide. Uh, next slide. I think we're getting into our resources. Oh, good. We're going to have plenty of time for questions. EEOC, I've mentioned several times. We have a local office in Minneapolis, JAN, Job Accommodation Network. And also, I think there's a, a, for, a, a resource that, that um, our lovely folks who are hosting today will send out to you. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Minnesota Resources, your Department of Human Rights is a place that they they have 13 protected classes, disability is one of them, and they can help individuals file a complaint if they've been discriminated against. 
I love our deed rehab rehabilitation services branch. Also, uh, state services for the blind are part of them and they are wonderful and they'll probably have more information for you. Um, next slide is if you still have questions, here are two places that you can go to. One uh, would be uh, me. At the, I am the director of ADA Minnesota, a program within the Metropolitan Center for Independent Living, um, nonprofit, not, not affiliated with a state agency at all. So um, if you call me, uh, just keep in mind, if you like me, great. If you didn't, I'm the only employee there. So I will be the one answering that phone call. Um, and also uh, you could contact the Great Lakes ADA Center that I am affiliated with. They have fabulous webinars and seminars really targeted to businesses and everything is archived there. So they are also a great resource. And now it looks, uh, we have 20 minutes left. I turn it back to the folks. I think they wanted to do a quick Q and A as well as share some wonderful resources with you as well. Wow, Cindy, thank you, thank you, thank you. This was absolutely a great presentation. I'm going to pull up the questions. We like to refer to this part of our presentation as stump the presenters. So if you have questions for Cindy, the link to the Microsoft form is in the chat and you can ask your questions in the chat. And Michelle, you or another person will be reading them out loud? Yep. Okay, cool. Because I'm not going into the chat. All good with the ASL interpreters? You keep up with me? Everybody could understand? <laughs> I have a Does lot of requests for the file um, or to have the resources sent. So thank you for putting your emails in. Question number one, if you use Indeed for hiring, do you meet the ADA requirements? So I am not, so tell me what you mean by the Indeed. Are you talking about like Connect 700? What are, what are we talking about here? Indeed is actually a job search website. Mm -hmm. um, if the person that asked that question is still with us and would like to unmute yourself, please feel free. Not to put you on the spot, so but I'm clear. With Indeed, you kind of spoke of in hiring, if people just go to our websites, our websites, capable to help people with disabilities see and, and hear from them. We use Indeed, so wondering if that online source gives people with disabilities the capability to um, do those extra things. So what, what extra things? You had spoke of if they have to, um, what do I want to say? If they have a special, and I don't want to say lens, but a special computer system. Oh, screen reader. All those items. Yeah. Okay. You're talking about screen readers. So I'm assuming that the state runs Indeed, right? It's a it's a Title II program. It is not a Title II program. I believe it's a private, no. a public program. Yeah. Okay. yeah. For recruiting. In, Indeed is a national private company okay. that runs an online job. It's not related to the National Labor Exchange. Okay. So either so it doesn't it doesn't thank you, by the way. So I was just trying to figure out what title. So title two, I mean if we had more time, I could explain. Title two, two title two is like our state and local government. So like this training today that was sponsored by a state agency definitely needed to be not only accessible, but to a higher standard. But indeed, probably as a Title III entity, a public accommodation, they still need to comply with the ADA. So yes, even if it's a private company, they would need to make sure that they have formatted their system to be accessible to screen reader. And if they're not, um, somebody could, or you know, file a complaint against them if they're not able to access it through Screen Reader. So, so as a company, be. if we allow our website, 
Indeed has another source. Are we covered because we allow Indeed as another source? Or do we have to do it with our own website as well? If we allow other sources of applying, they can apply coming into the office. They can apply by paper. They can um, um, apply through the website, through Indeed, through all the LinkedIn, all those. Are we complying then? Are we compliant? Um, you're compliant-ish. I mean, I would, you know, I mean, it's it's a fine line because, you know, 33 years out of the ADA and in, in Minnesota, I mean, at least for state agencies, we've adapted Section 508, which federally says that any federal or state dollars, you know, that goes into virtual or electronic stuff needs to be accessible to screen readers. So we have this new law coming out, this WCAG 2.0, where everything needs to be accessible to screen readers. So yes, if you offer other options and they are equally available, but if a person who is not blind can click on that Indeed website and immediately apply for a job, but the other person who's blind needs to wait two weeks for that braille to come in the mail, that's not equitable and that would not be compliant with the ADA. So as a company, we're about 80 people, what do we need to do then? Well, you know, I would first and foremost, I'm, I'm assuming a large company, you have an IT person. So I think you, I would have that IT person call maybe like the Minnesota Council on Disability has a wonderful staff person there, Chad um, Miller, I believe is his name. I can get you that information and he can help you to figure out uh, a company that maybe could help you make your website compliant, or he could, you know, do a run through maybe and, and point out the areas uh, that need work. But there's lots of resources. Don't panic. There's lots of resources that can help you. If your internal IT person is not, does not know how to do this, uh, there's courses, there's classes, and there's resources of people that can definitely help you do it. And I can help you to get those to the, I can help you get to those people. So and I think the website is adaptable to screen readers, we would be okay. Yes, I mean, yes. If somebody who was blind would be able to utilize it like anybody else, yes. But everything had to be tagged, so they may have to go back in and re-tag things, which is not always pretty. That's why we say do it on the front end. Um, but yeah, but we can talk about this offline if you want, but I can get you to the people. Okay, thank you. Right, thank you, great question. All right, thanks, Cindy. Next question. If interviews are being conducted by dozens of different people company-wide, is it risky to include a question about needing an accommodation for the interview process if you can't guarantee that every interviewer will ask? Yeah, that it, well, yeah, I mean, either you make it company policy uh, that when you are interviewing, uh, whether you know people have disabilities or not, because again, largest group of people with disabilities are those with a hidden, a hidden or non-apparent disability. Um, I would try to make it across the board because uh, you want it to be as consistent as possible. Because then you might get somebody who said, "Well, you know, I got asked, you know, if I, you know, if I need an accommodation, I disclose that, and you didn't." and you got the job and I didn't, was it because I got asked and disclosed and you didn't? So I would make it a, a policy across the board if you've got multiple people doing these interviews. Anybody agree with me, disagree with me? <laughs> well, I'm gonna ask a follow-up question to that, Cindy. If HR is doing a pre-screening and they ask the question of the individual, and the individual moves forward to interviewing with the manager, or the supervisor, would the manager and supervisor need to ask that question again? Or would that question have been addressed with HR? Well, as long as HR is going to make sure that that, so if the person says, yes, I need an accommodation, I need alternative formatted materials, uh, for the interview process, then that HR person would be responsible for making sure that all future interviews, whether it's management, the, whoever it is, that those accommodations are in place. 
And if the person would say, no, I don't need an accommodation, then the supervisor and the manager would not need to right. ask that question. They would not need to, to read it. To, yeah. and, and remember, you, they don't have to ask, do you need an accommodation for the, and we're just talking about the interview process here, not the job. So you, they don't have to ask, do you need an accommodation for the interview process? You know, do a lot of businesses do this? Sure, it's, it's great. It takes the onus off the person with a disability. I'm just saying, if they do it, you got to ask everybody because you don't know who a person with a disability is or is not. And it could look skewed if that person doesn't get the job and somebody else does, you were asked they weren't. So I would say all or nothing on that question. Okay. Everybody, everybody it's asked of everybody or it's asked of nobody. All right. And yep. there's also the case, somebody may bring it up themselves and that's great. Somebody may say, hey, I need an accommodation for the interview process. Keep that information confidential and provide that accommodation. Okay, thank you. Time for one more question and then we will move on to learning a little bit more about a new state of Minnesota program um, for accommodations. What happens if an employee asks to work from home and the company does not have resources to have people working from home? It was noted that they had a need for an accommodation. They come back two months later stating that they need this as an accommodation per a doctor's note. How does an employer navigate this situation? So, there, so what I'm hearing is the individual got medical documentation because of their disability, they need remote work, but the company, maybe it's so small or whatnot, doesn't have the resources to set them up maybe with the computer, the internet, the desk. Is that what I'm hearing? Is that kind of that they don't yes. have the resources? So that is a perfect lead in, I think, to the next couple slides. Am I right? On this, I, I think I'm going to defer to my colleagues because there may be some resources that this employer may be able to utilize in which to to make uh you know uh, an accessible uh workspace uh for that individual maybe it'll fit maybe it won't but um there are resources for it for that the company but again they'd have to prove if they're saying the undue hardship is they can't afford to provide these resources they're going to have to prove that they really can't afford to provide these resources you know, I mean, is it really out of their ability to, um, you know, pay for the internet at the person's house or, um, you know, set up a desk there or have a, a traveling laptop? They'd have to show where that is not, you know, we're 33 years out of the ADA. Most companies have a, a budget line for accommodations or should uh, that they would be able to tap that, but maybe it's tapped out. So um, I'm going to pass it on to my colleagues and they may have other resources to share with you. All right, great. Thank you so much, Cindy. We are going to reshare um, the PowerPoint and hear from our coworker with State Services for the Blind, Ray McCoy. Take it away, Ray. All right, thank you. So just to kind of segue into this, um, I think there, there was that question about like the uh, whether if like an employee wanted to work from home and if you had the funds or you're saying that you do not have the funds to do so so we will definitely address that there so thank you for that Cindy so overall like as you see like accommodations can be costly right I mean usually with a business like you know you're still trying to figure out like how can I balance things out or whatnot so how can I basically do these accommodations and still be able to run my business? Well, that's where this program comes in, the Employer Reasonable Accommodation Fund, or ERAF. It's a two-year pilot program that reimburses eligible employers like yourselves for reasonable accommodation purchases made for job applicants and or employees with disabilities. And the reimbursement periods are like, let's say that you hired somebody and they come to you for, you know, saying that they have a disability, you know, after July 1st. Um, 
those accommodations, any accommodation that you have submitted or like, you know, made that cost money between July 1st and June 30th of 2025 is eligible. So the purpose of this, this program, the ERAF is what we like to call it here for short, is that it promotes hiring people with disabilities by reducing any real or perceived financial hardships and providing accommodations. And again, like I stated, it's available statewide to small and medium-sized employers, which I'll get into in the next slide. And we have been appropriated $2 million per, no, go back, go back. All right, so we've been appropriated like $2 million per year. So this fiscal year, and then the next fiscal year. So that's 2 million per year, and then 300 is used for administrative costs, such as like, you know, myself, and we're actually, you know, looking at bringing on another person here in a minute. But like I said, overall, quite a bit of funding over a two year period and we want to use and I'll kind of go into like the details here shortly. So again, like I said, I'm, I'm housed at state services for the blind, so to speak, but this is through the State Department of Employment and Economic Development. And while you can backdate expenses all the way to July 1st, I mean, this program officially launched September 1st. So next slide, please. Let's go on to some eligibility requirements. So eligibility, we try to keep it as you know simple as possible. You have to be obviously domiciled within the legal boundaries of Minnesota and your principal place of business, you know, as identified in the certificate of incorporation within the state of Minnesota guidelines. Your business must not have any more than 500 employees at all throughout the calendar year and must not generate anything more than 5 million in annual gross revenue. All right. This program, you know, overall be no cost to you. What happens is, and I'll kind of go in through kind of that process, picking up where Cindy left off. So as you stated, like, you know, your employer comes to you, says, you know, I need an accommodation for, you know, this, this, and that. And, or they just say, hey, I have a disability and I need an accommodation. They don't necessarily know what that accommodation is. Then, you know, obviously, you want to figure out like what things, you know, what costs there are, and you might have some ideas, but one service we offer that is free to you guys as businesses is that we will sit down with you and do a business consultation, which will be with myself and believe me, I have a lot of, you know, people supporting me in this role that I'll pull them in, whether it's like, you know, within the department here, within state services for the blind, or even go as far as like, you know, talk with somebody with the Council of Disabilities, because we want to make sure that you have, you know, as adequate of, you know, disability as like accommodation is needed to support your employee. All right. And like I said, that consultation is no cost to you. So let's say you go ahead, you, we find out, you know, what accommodations are necessary for the employee, you purchase them, and so then what you're gonna do, and again, this will be shared near the end of the show here, is that we will go ahead and like, look at your application, you'll apply through our website, which again, I'll share here at the end of the show and make sure that you provide all the stuff we ask, plus any supporting documentation, such as like primarily the receipt of what you purchased, right? And once we get that, we review it. If it's approved, you'll be notified that it's approved and we will reimburse you that amount, all right? Which will lead me into my next slide. All right, actually, what we're gonna do is skip around. We'll come back to this one. So go forward one, since we kind of talked about that. So let's talk about reimbursement limits here. So like, you know, again, the maximum total reimbursement per eligible employer in the state fiscal year, you know, is, $30,000. So this amount basically, you know, is like a total of both whether you need like a one time accommodation expense, or if you have ongoing accommodation expenses. So, you know, submissions for one time reasonable accommodation expenses must be no less than $250, but it also caps out at $15,000 per individual with disability. 
So if an employer submits a reimbursement for more than the maximum amount, ERAF will only reimburse you up to that $15,000 limit. And again, so if you have obviously two employees within this time, within this fiscal year, and they both need like, you know, accommodations up to that, like you would like basically be capped out at your 30,000. So 15,000 for one employee, 15,000 for another, all right? Saying that you were hiring, if you hire two employees at that point where, you know, needed, like they needed accommodations. So on the other hand though, submissions for like, ongoing reasonable accommodation expenses have no minimum or maximum requirements. Again, going back to the top here, because I know this is a little confusing. It was, you know, being that I'm still a baby, it's still kind of confusing to me. So I'm just throwing that out there that your expenses regardless are going to cap out at $30,000. But let's say you had like something like ongoing, such as like, you know, language interpretation, captioning services, or even job coaching, you know, it doesn't matter what that cost is, you know, as long as like, you know, it'll be going like ongoing throughout the year, but as long as it, you know, does not exceed that $30,000. Okay, does that make sense, everybody? So let's take a step back here. So again, I'm not going to go too, too much into this because Cindy really did a heck of a job breaking this down. But you know, going back to that example that she used for like, you know, employees who need to work from home again, and kind of understanding that like one of the things that could be a reasonable accommodation in this place, and that would be definitely after like, you know, you guys talk with us, we kind of sit down is assistive technology, such as like, you know, laptops. So like, you know, we have like, you know, in our short time have like, you know, looked at you know, computers and things like that to make it as a reasonable accommodation for an employee. All right. So things like laptops or whatnot are definitely included as a means to help the employee be able to work remotely. All right. But other things that are, you know, that are obviously prevalent that Cindy probably didn't talk about ergonomic workstations or seating, whether it be, you know, primarily at the office is from what I know now. Um, again, lifting aids, lightings, alarms, low vision aids and devices, noise canceling services, sign language interpreters, like we you know, talked about again, sorry for being repetitive, and even assist or subscriptions to assistive technology, you know, in order to help your employee do a better job. All right, so now let's go two spaces forward. All right, so again, you know, this is just a brief overview. We can go into, you know, a little bit more detail. If you like, you can reach out to me, but here's the website, um, an email. I get these emails directly. So definitely feel free to email me this. And um, I'll actually, you know, if I can, do we have this like, you know, that we can send out in the chat, Liz? Yeah, if we could send that out in the chat um, along with the number, that'd be great. So, Myself, like I said, I'm Ray McCoy. I'm the program coordinator, just came on board this month. So it's a huge learning curve. And we're actually hiring a technician to manage all the back end, like finance, like, you know, financial transactions here. So we're hoping to actually have that person on board within the next couple of weeks. All right. So with that being said, let's go forward. I think that is about it here for now. All right. And so I'm going to hand it back to Liz. Thank you, Ray, for being on the team and presenting this information. And thank you to Michelle for being our technical host today and Cindy for all of the information that we always learn a thing or two um, every time we re revisit the ADA. So I really appreciate all of this. Um, please reach out to any of us. The easiest way is to email careerforce at state.mn.us, and they can route your phone call to the appropriate vocational rehabilitation services person, to myself, to any of the resources. We will be taking your emails off the questions uh, form. And those of you who put your email in the chat, I did get those too, and we'll get all of these links and uh, the link to the recording after we post it on YouTube so that you can share it with staff. Um, and 
take up Cindy's offer to contact her at any time. We will include that information in the email out to everyone. So thank you all for being here and thank you once again to all of our speakers and all the information. Take care, have a good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks everyone. Thank you to the ASL interpreters too. You did a great job. All right. I, I, I'm gonna skedaddle, but I, I think I saw the highest number was 122. So that's, I think what I'm gonna go with, unless you guys saw a different number. That's what I also saw, Cindy, thank you. Yeah, that looks about right. Yep. Okay, cool. Well, thanks guys. And if you have any tips or tricks or feedback, um, shoot me an email, let me know. Otherwise, I think we'll do it again next year if you want, or on a different topic. Or I shot I shot out a couple of different topics, hoping that you know employers will you know maybe reach out, or if you guys want to set that up, um, sure. All right. Thanks, Cindy. Appreciate okay. it. Thanks, Cindy. My pleasure. Bye bye. Bye. And thanks to everyone for you guys' work on this. I I appreciate it. I I used to do these things by myself, and I told my boss yesterday it's nice to have the team. Uh, you know, supporting, you know, supporting something. So appreciate, appreciate everything that y'all did. So. One of the, one of my challenges was every time I would admit someone, I would lose my spot in advancing the PowerPoint. Uh, I don't know. Sure. I need more tips, more tips and tricks. Yeah, that's why it's it's helpful to have multiple a, people. Well, an account, yeah, with co-presenters, not just co-hosts, but a co-presenter who also has a Zoom link that can share those behind the scenes duties with you. Well, I appreciate you just jumping in, Liz <laughs> and Ray and Font and everyone's help. It was great. I will um take a look at the q a in the microsoft forms liz and forward any addresses um that are in in that yeah yeah and i've got a list of 41 people that have put it in the chat so i started this right. and then we can you and i can figure out the details later yeah sounds good okay thank you, thank you. perfect great. thanks everyone great. good meeting you virtually sure we'll <laughs> be chatting oh yeah definitely all right take care right. everybody yep, yep. bye bye